Championship. Okay. Okay, folks. Well, you can tell, I, I, you know, I, I always gauge the success of a meeting by the kind of energy in the room, and we've got so much energy in the room, it's hard to control them. I, it, uh, it's got to be you, Eric. I don't, uh, at this hour of the day on a Thursday, normally people's blood sugar is so low, you know, they're sleeping rather peacefully through the fort procession. Not today. It's going to be great. Welcome. We're glad, we're glad you're all here. This is a, this is a great opportunity for us as we continue the Military Strategy Forum, and I do want to say special thanks to our friends at Rolls-Royce that are able to make us possible for us to do this for the Washington policy community. Uh, great pleasure to welcome Eric Olson. Now, this is a, I, I, I just asked him, we'd not met before, although I've known him reputationally, and I assumed any guy with the name Eric Olson who's from Seattle, had to either be Norwegian or Swedish, and it turns out he's Cherokee, you know, okay? So <laughs> I really kind of blew that wide open, huh? You know, it's just so, so much my ethnic stereotyping. Um, but he's, I should have known, however, because he's got the reputation for being tougher than a woodpecker's lips, and, uh, and he's had every command that uh, you can have in the Special Forces, and of course is now at the top, and it's a, a great opportunity for us to have him here. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is an important discussion uh, for us to be having uh, as a policy community that thinks about, about national security. Uh, I, I was up on the Hill when uh, the act was created that created uh, Program 11. And uh, at the time, it was a Hobbesian choice because it was a community that was suffering inside a big military establishment that didn't value it. And then the question was, how do you promote it? And you promote it by giving it an independent status and standing, but then it created a more structural barriers that we have to work through. And I think that's the central question of how do we how do we integrate a force that's out every day, far more engaged than normal forces, uh, and it has been, I think, nonstop here, uh, but make it part of a whole? And we're still working on that. And, uh, and I, this is why I'm so anxious to hear Eric's thoughts this morning and our panelists who are going to share further conversation with us. So it's a wonderful morning. Thank you all for coming. Let me turn it to Ozzie Nelson, who's going to do this for real and give you a proper introduction. Thanks, Eric. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Ozzie Nelson, and I'm the uh, director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism uh, Program today. Uh, I'll be the moderator for the first part of our event, which will be Admiral Olson's remarks, and then uh, we'll uh, allow the admiral and his uh, party to depart, and then we'll break into the panel, which will be hosted by uh, uh, Jim Mikulczewski. Um a Admiral Olson is the, is the eighth commander of Special Operations Command. Uh, his bio is in front of you. Um, I won't read it to you. After reading his bio, I realized that mine was probably four four sizes too big um, so now I need to go back and reduce mine if I can capture if he can capture his very um, uh, prestigious career in such short uh, uh, language I must be able to capture mine um, but basically he has served in a variety almost every uh, role as a special operator from a staff officer to a peacekeeper to to a, uh, a direct action uh, individual and um, uh, he is obviously um, um, well respected as and uh, in, 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 in is the first Navy force star uh, seal uh, in the history of the community. Uh, we were just talking about that beforehand. Um, after the Admiral gives his remarks, we'll go ahead and go into some questions. Um, for the Admiral, I'll be the moderator, which is, I get the one with the big ruler. There are questions and answers, not statements and answers. So out of uh, respect for the Admiral and his time, um, please limit your uh, remarks to a question and give the Admiral an opportunity to, to respond to it. Uh, and we will have microphones about too, so you can ask your question with a microphone. Uh, but again, we are truly honored to have uh, Admiral Olson here, and uh, sir, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. 
Good morning. Thank you, Ozzy. Dr. Hamry, thanks for that uh, kind introduction. I do claim some Cherokee blood, but I also can't deny my Scandahoovian roots. Uh, I am honored to be here with you this morning. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I, I relish this opportunity to represent the members of the United States Special Operations Command, all that that great force does. My remarks today will follow a simple progression. I'll begin with an overview of the United States Special Operations Command, its functions and its authorities, and then I'll talk about SOCOM's role in the current operational environment. And finally, I'll talk about the future environment and how I see United States Special Operations Command fitting in uh, to what the United States and the United States Department of Defense do uh, in the future. At the end of my remarks, I do look forward to an informal question and answer period with you. I'll be especially eager to discuss what United States Special Operations Command is doing with its, its budget and its acquisition authorities. My purpose this morning is clearly not to market United States Special Operations Command or Special Operations Forces. The people who serve in the operational units are by far the best representatives of the talent and capabilities that this community has to offer. I'm more here uh, to educate. Uh, United States Special Operations Command and Special Operations Forces are unique within the Department of Defense. Our roles and missions are unique and, and we're unique in how we prepare and present our force to operational commanders around the world who employ them. Much of this is quite nuanced, uh, but I think it's useful for this audience especially to understand it. And I don't mean to sound professorial in my uh, presentation this morning at all, but I will support any of your requests for college credit when I'm done. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me begin with a brief history of how United States Special Operations Command came to be and the basic architecture and functions of the command. Some of you lived through this, uh, but it's worth a review. Uh, this will be a, a SOCOM 101 of sorts. Uh, the Department of Defense activated United States Special Operations Command about 23 years ago. In fact, we're about three weeks shy of our 23rd birthday. Um, April 16th, 1987, activated at McDill Air Force Base, Florida, where the commander and the staff of United States Readiness Command uh, were sort of reflavored as United States Special Operations Command. The first commander, General Jim Lindsay, who was on his way to take command of Readiness Command, was renominated and reconfirmed as the first commander of United States Special Operations Command in route. The, this is established uh, as a result of law. The Unified uh, Combatant Command was created as legislated by an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act of 1986, often known as the Nunn-Cohen Amendment or Cohen-Nunn Amendment, depending on who's Secretary of Defense at the time. As a follow-on to the Goldwater Nichols Defense Auth uh, Reorganization Act, Congress mandated that a four-star command uh, be established and demanded that it be a four-star command in order to give it true parity uh, with the other unified combatant commands and that it be established to prepare special operations forces to carry out assigned missions and, if directed by the President or the Secretary of Defense, to plan for and conduct special operations. Title 10, Section 167 of the United States Code defines United States Special Operations Command, its authorities and its responsibilities, which uniquely combined certain aspects of the other combatant commands, the military departments, and certain defense agencies. So uniquely, United States Special Operations Command does have its own budget authorities and budget responsibilities. Through Major Force Program, as Dr. Hamry described, it is Major Force Program 11 in the Department of Defense budget. It is provided separately to the Secretary of Defense for the purpose of, of answering those requirements that are peculiar to special operations in nature. And the Commander of Special Operations Command is the manager and executor of that budget. Additionally, we have our own acquisition authorities so that Special Operations Command can develop and procure, and develop means in, includes research uh, and development activities, and then procure Special Operations Peculiar Equipment, Supplies, or Services. And the headquarters is also re responsible for the development of Special Operations Doctrine, just as military services write their own doctrine. And 
responsible for the training and education of special operations skills and knowledge to relying on the services for service common aspects of that. Uh, but Special Operations Command, again, uh, is responsible for the special operations peculiar aspects of training and education. Before September 11th, 2001, U.S. SOCOM's primary focus was on organizing, training, and equipping Special Operations Forces and providing forces to support the geographic combatant commanders of the world, Central Command, European Command, Pacific Command, and the like. Also supported U.S. ambassadors and their country teams. This was steady work, kept our operational force employed and deployed about 25% of the time, meaning about 25% of the force on any given day uh, was outside the United States in support of operational uh, commanders and, and U.S. ambassadors, mostly conducting theater security engagement activities with counterpart forces in several dozen countries at a time, and over the course of a typical year would have served in 120 to 140 different countries around the world. In 2004, with a force heavily engaged in both Afghanistan and Iraq, the Secretary of Defense and the President expanded the United States Special Operations Command's responsibilities, and when finally codified as policy, U.S. SOCOM was assigned as the combatant command responsible for synchronizing the Department of Defense's planning for global operations of, against violent extremist organiz organizations and networks. Synchronizing was not a doctrinal term at the time. Synchronizing needed to be defined, uh, and so it was defined through the codification process uh, that assigned United States Special Operations Command uh, that authority. And, and it is essentially the responsibility, synchronization is arranging in time, place, and purpose actions for maximum or optimum effect. But note that I said we synchronize planning. We don't synchronize operations. The operations themselves are synchronized by the operational commanders who have responsibility for the outcome of the operations. And in that case, we are clearly in a supporting role and we are a force provider. The geographic combatant commanders each have a sub-unified special operations command known as a theater special operations command or TSOC through which they generally exercise their operational command, their operational authorities. These theater special operations commands are themselves commanded by one or two star special operations admirals or generals who work for that geographic combatant commander supported by our headquarters at United States Special Operations Command. And with baseball season just over the horizon, the analogy is that these theater special operations commands are the catcher's mitts into which United States Special Operations Command pitches our deployed force. They then receive and employ the force on behalf of their geographic combatant commander bosses. So as a synchronizer, United States Special Operations Command reviews, uh, re receives, reviews, coordinates, and prioritizes <laughs> Department of Defense plans that support the global campaign against terrorists and their networks. And then we make recommendations to the Joint Staff and the Office of the Secretary of Defense regarding force and resource allocations to meet global requirements. This is in response to the demands presented by the geographic combatant commanders. And then in 2008, United States Special Operations Command was further designated as the Department of Defense proponent for security force assistance. And proponent is another term without a clear definition. The <laughs> authorities of proponency are in fact conveyed in whatever mechanism assigns one as a proponent. But SOCOM responsibilities in this role are similar to our responsibilities for synchronizing the planning uh, against violent extremist networks. We assist policymakers in deciding which potential partner nations the United States military ought to work with, in what priority, and in what manner. And then through a staffing process carefully in conjunction with United States Joint Forces Command, we receive requests for a, uh, for assistance forces from geographic combatant commanders and make recommendations to the joint staff regarding which special operations forces, which general purpose forces, or which combination of forces are most appropriate for a particular security force assistance mission. This is and will continue to be a very collaborative effort in which we advocate and support department policies and direct coordination with our interagency partners primarily with State Department, but also with USAID, Treasury, and Justice, and many others. 
And security of force assistance is emerging as a more powerful term. It is, e it is becoming a more coherent path through which our nation can better work with international friends and partners. It is bringing together many disparate, uncoordinated efforts uh, under, a, under a single umbrella. So where generally does the United States Special Operations Command fit into United States strategy? The most recent revision of the national defense strategy includes the need to strengthen current alliances and build new partnerships to defeat global terrorism and prevent attacks against us, our allies, and our friends. It includes the need to prevent our enemies from acquiring and using weapons of mass destruction. It includes the need to work with others to help defuse regional conflicts and the need to transform national security institutions to face the challenges of the 21st century. The National Defense Strategy also describes the strategic environment for the foreseeable future, although foreseeable future is a term that I view as oxymoronic, as a, as a global struggle against violent extremist ideology that seeks to overturn or overrun the international state system. It goes further, suggesting that beyond this transnational struggle, we will face other threats, including a variety of irregular challenges, quest by rogue states to acquire nuclear weapons, and the rising military powers of other nation states. Success in dealing with these threats will require the orchestration of national and international power over years and decades to come, and this will have to be done in an unprecedented way. United States Special Operations Command's piece of the defense pie lies primarily in our global responsibilities to provide trained and ready special operations forces, to synchronize Department of Defense planning against violent extremist organizations and to serve as Department of Defense's proponent for security force assistance. In order to do this, it's the responsibility of United States Special Operations Command to transcend the boundaries of the geographic combatant commanders. Before I get into more into discussing what SOCOM does in the current operating environment, I do need to touch on what special operations activities are. There are currently 12 activities that are specifically assigned to United States Special Operations Command. These are, most of them are included in the original legislation that established this. They are defined as core special operations activities insofar as they relate to special operations forces. This does not give Special Operations Command ownership of any of these activity areas but it does mean that within each of these activity areas, there are tasks that are peculiar to special operations in nature, and therefore our responsibility to prepare a force to conduct. These 12 tasks, I'll just read through them briefly. They're direct action, counterterrorism, counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction, unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, security force assistance, civil military operations, psychological operations, information operations, counterinsurgency, special reconnaissance, and the catch-all, other activities as may be specified <laughs> by the Secretary of Defense or the President. So there's a few obvious ones in there, such as direct action and counterterrorism. These are clearly bread and butter activities within the special operations community, but there's also a few that are more nuanced, and I'll just talk about a couple of them because they and your understanding of them are important to our current operations. First is unconventional warfare. This is often misunderstood as the opposite of conventional warfare. It's not. Unconventional warfare really is a doctrinally defined set of activities that essentially is stimulating and supporting insurgents. Uh, when there is a government that is considered illegitimate or hostile, that is challenged by, uh, by a force, uh, then, then supporting that force is unconventional warfare. And this was the case in Afghanistan in the opening weeks of Operation Enduring and Freedom, where there was a relatively mature but relatively incapable uh, force in opposition to the illegitimate hostile Taliban government in place at the time that was predominantly the Northern Alliance, but it was partnered with other uh, forces within Afghanistan. And the insertion of a relative handful of 12-man operational detachments, Alpha, Green Beret, A-teams, uh, then supported and stimulated that Northern Alliance force and the other 
uh, anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan in an unconventional warfare campaign that ultimately led uh, to the Afghans themselves evicting the Taliban from Kabul. So unconventional warfare is, is essentially the flip side of counterinsurgency. And now that there is a legitimate government in place in Afghanistan, supported by the United States and challenged by an al-Qaeda-supported Taliban insurgency, we've transitioned from unconventional warfare to counterinsurgency uh, as an activity in, uh, in <coughs> Afghanistan. This counterinsurgency, as, as conducted by the United States, is primarily through the conduct of foreign internal defense and security force assistance activities. So these include all actions intended to enable Afghan sovereignty and the protection of the Afghan peoples. So one can make the case that al-Qaeda is now the unconventional warfare force uh, stimulating and supporting the Taliban in its challenge against the government that they consider to be hostile to them. Uh, the last core activity that I'll highlight here is psychological operations. Again, a broadly misunderstood term. It may stir up in certain audiences images of mind control or brainwashing. I call it truth-telling for a purpose. The truth as a matter of law and as a matter of policy and for the purpose of influencing a foreign audience in a manner that is helpful to mission success and generally and most often uh, for mutually beneficial purposes. It does involve the distribution of information to serve, uh, again, primarily mutually beneficial purposes, including those intended to demoralize our enemies. Uh, so it's... Uh, that's a bit about SOCOM's roles and missions. I'll get more into that during the question and answer period if you want me to. Uh, now I'll get into how we do some of what we do. Uh, SOCOM has a responsibility to synchronize the planning to defeat violent extremist organizations and networks. These net organizations could be radical Islamic groups. They could be narco-terrorist networks and other non-state actors who threaten the United States. The Department of Defense campaign strategy against terrorism is contained in Concept Plan 7500. This is 750 pages long. It's top secret in classification, but in a brief and unclassified manner, I can tell you that it is the Department of Defense plan crafted by United States Special Operations Command, first uh, approved by Secretary Rumsfeld and then by Secretary of Gates. So it became the Department of Defense Con plan. It, it has authority within the Department of Defense. It is a guiding plan as it affects other combatant commanders and the military services. But it's a supporting plan in the interagency environment for combating violent extremist organizations. And it's supported by regional plans crafted by each of the geographic combatant commanders around the world. It does provide the framework for two fundamental approaches to defeat our adversaries. We call them the direct approach and the indirect approach. These are terms that are making their way into the common lexicon. Uh, while the direct approach focuses on isolating the enemy threats and then taking military actions against them, the indirect approach focuses on shaping and influencing the environment to eliminate local support to or tolerance of terrorists and their activities. So these approaches are independent. They cannot be isolated from each other. Uh, they are certainly not mutually exclusive, and both are necessary to form the balanced whole. The direct approach, as you would suspect, consists of those efforts to directly disrupt violent extremist organizations. This is capturing, killing, interdicting, and otherwise destroying terrorists, their facilities, their organizations, and their networks in order to prevent them from harming, harming us in the near term. It also denies access to and use of weapons of mass destruction by violent extremist organizations, some of whom have clearly expressed their intent to acquire and use them against us. These operations are conducted almost exclusively by military forces. Uh, DOD is in the lead for the United States on the direct approach. It's urgent, it's necessary, it's chaotic, it's kinetic, and the effects are almost always near-term and short-lived. While the direct approach is required to mitigate immediate threats, the overall effects of the direct approach are not decisive. The direct approach is a holding action that buys time and space for the indirect approach 
to achieve its long-term results. Decisive results come from the indirect approach in which we enable partners to, violent, to combat violent extremist uh, organizations by contributing to their capabilities through advising, training, equipping, or otherwise supporting their efforts. Uh, it includes efforts to increase other governments' willingness or improve their capabilities to remove terrorist sanctuaries from their territories, and includes military support to activities intended to erode the underlying causes, the underlying factors uh, of, that contribute to, to terrorist activity in the first place, the, the basic conditions of economic depression, religious extremism, intimidation, and more. So stabilizing the environment impacts the enemy in the long term. It is the concept of draining the alligators, I'm sorry, draining the swamp rather than attempting to capture or kill all the alligators. So although the direct and indirect approaches are fairly easy to define in theory, they are often difficult to distinguish in practice. It is a careful balance that is required and often an intertwining. People, units, and capabilities cannot be categorized as either direct or indirect. Some of the activities that they <clears throat> conduct can be categorized as direct or indirect, but only at the time that those activities are occurring and often they occur simultaneously. The military is in the lead on the direct approach, as I said, and in the, direct, in the indirect approach, the United States military is to a large degree pushing from behind. It's not our responsibility to lead the indirect approach, but admittedly, much of the capability, at least in the United States government, to conduct these kinds of activities, the mass and the money, reside within the Department of Defense. There's a balance between the two that, again, that has to be carefully executed. And this is where you will find the core of special operations. In the, in the balance of effective direct and indirect operations, the combination of high-end, high-technology-enabled tactical skills and the understanding of the operational context of their application. A good example of this is what occurs in most days in both Iraq and Afghanistan, training with the Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, Afghan Army commandos, the Iraqi Special Operations Forces at a very high level, training, eating, living, planning, fighting with them. Uh, when, when the counterpart forces fight with us in support, it looks like the direct approach. They look like us, they move like us, they shoot like us. Uh, through night vision video, it's difficult to tell them apart from us. It looks very much like the direct approach when they burst into a room in the middle of the night to put the habeas grabus on the bad guys, separate the, the good from the bad. The ultimate effect uh, of this ultimately, though, is enabling partners to combat violent extremist organizations themselves so that we can leave and they can control their own destiny. That intertwining happens several times a night in several places across Iraq and Afghanistan, it consumes most of our special operations force that we provide on any given day, whether it's in Baghdad or Anbar or Marja or Farah. Another example from Afghanistan comes from special forces teams living in remote camps well apart from any other military force. Their purpose is to understand the local environment, steep themselves in it, and contribute to local security by identifying and supporting the tribal and village leaders who are willing to take action against the Taliban. Support in this, came, in this case comes mostly in the form of schools, wells, bridges, and other development projects as rewards for anti-Taliban activities in these villages. And as you can imagine, this is very sensitive, it's quite dangerous, and it's being done every day by special operations troops in their 20s and 30s. Our nation's special operations forces are also at work applying the indirect approach elsewhere around the world. We are typically in 75 to 80 countries on any given day, mostly conducting unit-to-unit -unit engagements and training events. These operations involve a special forces A team, a SEAL platoon, a, a Marine Special Operations team, Air Force combat aviation advisors, often working in remote places with a relative handful of counterparts. And for many of the partner nation units, this is the most prestigious training that they will get all year, and it leads to some very important relationships. 
We do many civil affairs operations during which our forces work with local leaders and USAID whenever and wherever possible to determine which schools need to be painted and where schools ought, and where wells ought to be dug or what else will bring value to our presence. And we normally contract with local people to do the work so everybody wins. But the key to success in this balanced approach is persistence, building partnerships is key, and it requires the fostering of long-term military-to-military relationships, and ideally these military relationships will survive the temporary vagaries of politics. Uh, the decisive effects of our nation's persistent engagement with partners around the world can be seen clearly in places like the Republic of the Philippines, where for over five years special operations forces have been advising and assisting that nation's armed forces in their successful campaign against radical Islamic insurgents who are linked to Al-Qaeda in their southern islands. Even more pronounced are the effects of our nation's persistent partnership and military engagement in support of Colombian forces, where for over 10 years U.S. Special Operations Forces have been advising and assisting the armed forces of Colombia in their fight against the leftist FARC. In recent years, the Colombian Armed Forces have dealt serious blows to that organization, and as you all know, in about a year and a half ago, it culminated in the dramatic rescue of U.S. and Colombian hostages. The significance of that operation is that it was planned, led, and conducted by the Colombians themselves, Colombians who had trained with and among United States Special Operations <laughs> Forces for several years. It's a testament to the time and the resources and the efforts that our nation has committed to enhancing their capacity over the last decade. In order to best train our people and put the people in the right place at the right time, we do need to have an understanding of our current and future operational environments. The United States Special Operations Command Headquarters has developed a way of thinking about the future world. We don't pretend that this is an estimate or a forecast, simply a way of thinking about it. It's based on trends and connections uh, that we see emerging, a prioritization of, the, of those, which ones are positive that ought to be encouraged, which ones are negative that ought to be challenged in some way. Uh, we see an increasing globalization, uh, complexity and chaos emerging from, from this thought model. Uh, there's an increasing demand for natural resources beyond oil that's driving people to move and, and to compete within their regions or around the globe. Regional economies and societies and cultures are becoming increasingly intertwined by the g growing global networks of <coughs> communication and, and finance and trade. The nature of the geostrategic environment is clearly changing. Until the end of the Cold War, the bipolar nature of the strategic environment allowed nation states to effectively hold global friction points to a manageable level. The security environment was actually less complex, but national economies were also less intertwined and, and less interdependent. And more importantly, nation states themselves exerted control over information that equated to a primacy of influence over their populations. But today, the strategic environment can no longer be viewed in the pure Westphalian model of nation states, although that model will endure as a model of international order. Uh, <coughs> for some time to come. Rather, the international complexity now uh, has supranational and national and non-state actors competing for strategic influence and access across the globe. The, the friction produced by the interaction of three dominant factors, these being transnational crime, violent extremism, and significant migration are driving much of the way the world behaves, and, and these have become dominant global factors. The internal controls of nations, of nation states have eroded, and sovereignty ain't what it used to be. Territorial sovereignty can still be defined and defended to a great degree, but economic sovereignty, informational sovereignty, and cultural sovereignty are under continuous challenge. In areas where governments are not able to wield great influence over their people or support their basic needs, non-state alternatives are likely to emerge. Individuals may identify less with the state and in some cases return to historical and enduring affinities of tribal alliances, natural terrain boundaries, and 
familiar cultural norms. They may accept substitute governments that provide structure and process with intolerable limits. And the legitimate government then becomes less relevant in these places, and the non-state actor then gains local dominance. This is generally a destabilizing factor where it occurs, and it's an opportunity for crime and extremism to take root. United States Special Operations Command deliberately leans forward to ensure that proper resources and tools are being applied in these regions. We call it moving ahead of the sound of guns. As, as proud as we are of our ability to respond quickly to gunfire when it occurs, uh, we are at least as proud of our ability to move ahead of the sound of guns in order to prevent that sound ultimately from occurring in, in places that are at risk. Again, last week, United States Special Operations Command forces were present in 79 countries around the world to the tune of about 12,000 people. Not surprisingly, about 10,000, 86% of Special Operations forces deployed from the United States were deployed into the U.S. Central Command area of responsibilities. That's where the most urgent demand is. But while we were deployed to dozens of countries around the world, we were in direct combat in only two of them, Iraq and Afghanistan, we were at risk in perhaps a half a dozen others. So who actually does this? I'll talk about that for just a minute. Special Operations Forces now total over 58,000 people. About 52,000 of them are in uniform. And except for a couple of thousand at US SOCOM headquarters, the force resides primarily within force service components, US Army Special Operations Command, Navy Special Warfare Command, Air Force Special Operations Command, and Marine Corps Forces Special Operations Command, and in one sub-unified Joint Command, the Joint Special Operations Command. Slightly more than half of the total force is in the Army component, and the total force includes many of the forces that you would expect and are aware of. The Army Special Forces of the Green Berets, Army Rangers in the 75th Ranger Regiment, helicopter air crews, uh, rotary wing aviators in the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the Night Stalkers, uh, as active duty civil affairs and active duty psychological operations practitioners are under the command of Special Operations Command when they are in the United States. Air Force fixed wing air crews largely uh, flying the variants of the venerable C-130 Hercules platform, but getting more and more into smaller platforms, including the tilt rotor uh, CV-22 variant of the uh, uh, Special Operations variant of the Osprey. Uh, air traffic controllers uh, who can operate uh, independently in remote areas and, and pararescue, medic, pararescue medics from the Air Force. <coughs> Navy SEALs, uh, combatant craft crewmen, and many submarine operators, and Marine Corps Raid and Assault Forces and foreign training specialists, and then all of the vehicles and airplanes and helicopters and boats and logistics support and intelligence experts and administrative Specialists and, in, and technicians and instructors and strategists who support that force are within the United States Special Operations Command. There's a, a plethora of other disciplines that give the force its capability and its sustainability. About four-fifths of our force is active duty with about one-fifth in the Guard or Reserve. This is a significant shift from five years ago. Uh, we were about, uh, about one-third in the Reserve component as opposed to the one-fifth uh, that we are now. Uh, about two-thirds of our force is non-career special operations forces, meaning that they serve in the special operations community for an assignment or two over the course of their careers. About one-third is the soft careerists, those who volunteer are selected who go through a training program that typically has an attrition rate associated with it and then who earn a MOS, a military occupational specialty, uh, that, that assigns them to the Special Operations Forces uh, for, for most of their careers. Our operators average close to 30 years old. This is significantly older than uh, general purpose force units. They're about 70% married, and they are doing what it is they came in to do. About half of our force has come in since 9-1-1, and they are doing what they expected to do. At the heart of everything United States Special Operations Command does is the Special Operations Warrior. These are real people 
who go forth and conduct the difficult and dangerous missions that this nation asks them to do to solve the complex problems, to endure the challenges that make our strategies work. The complexity of the operating environment requires that special operations forces be of the highest quality, that they maintain the highest levels of warfighting expertise, but also that they understand where they are, that they have knowledge of the regional, the sub-regional, micro-regional environments in which they work. Too often special operations are thought of as unilateral high-risk one-shot deals. There are many times, of course, when that is the case, but what's truly special about special operations is the ability to work with and through others in pursuit of mutually beneficial outcomes to unusually complex situations. And fundamental to this effort is our recognition that humans are more important than hardware and that quality is more important than quantity in special operations forces. We believe that substance trumps theatrics, that knowledge trumps doctrine, that finesse trumps mass, and that presence without value is perceived as occupation. It is important to be able to accurately predict the effects of our behavior in the unchanging context of geography, culture, and history of the places we go. To do this requires an understanding that we simply don't have, and we in the Special Operations Forces do pride ourselves on being somewhat more uh, qualified with respect to languages and cultures and regional expertise than, than the broader military forces. Uh, but we remain underqualified in many key languages and dialects and undereducated in many key areas. We continue to expand these programs. We continually stress the need for a few individuals to be thoroughly steeped in other languages and other regions. We've collectively termed these projects and programs uh, Project Lawrence, inspired, of course, by T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, who's an imperfect model but one who does convey a sense of the value of local expertise. This is intended to produce individual regional expertise in a way that simply doesn't exist now, uh, so that we can gain and sustain a credible, persistent uh, approach in, in these regions. These initiatives include an exploration of innovative options to permit specialization without sacrificing promotion opportunities or retention, and this is a cultural challenge within our own military. And as important as retention is to maintaining our investment in people, recruitment is equally important. We do seek the right people for the right jobs. We hire the best people we can for the jobs that we assign them to do. One example of this is an initiative currently uh, primarily within the Army. It was stimulated by a request by Special Operations Command it was uh, supported strongly by the Secretary of the Army. It was approved by Secretary of Defense in November of 2008, and it was implemented just over a year ago in February 2009. This is an initiative known as MAVNI, Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest. And under this program, visa holders, not citizens, not green card holders, but visa holders uh, who are in the United States for a period of, of two years, are eligible to enlist in the United States Army. Uh, there is a vibrant uh, blog on this. Uh, a number of uh, visa holders in the United States are communicating with each other about the advantages and disadvantages of, enli advantages of enlisting in the United States military, but the response has been tremendous, and 14,000 uh, people have filled out uh, the form that indicates an interest in enlisting in the Army, 4,000 of these indicated an interest in serving in or in support of Special Operations Forces. Over 800 are now, uh, have now enlisted in the United States Army, 172 are under orders to the Special Operations Community, 81 have already reported for duty. All of them speak English as a second or third or fourth language. 82% of them have at least an associate's degree. One-third of the master's degrees that enlisted into the United States Army last year enlisted through the MAVNI program. So if I sound excited about this, I am. It is, uh, it is one that we continue to support and, and consider ourselves primary, uh, yeah, to, to, to be of primary benefit uh, uh, to us. Uh, we do recognize that, uh, that non-military and, and non-government sectors of American society 
as well contain specific areas of expertise that are essential to progress in the military campaigns in this new normal. Uh, from anthropologists to x-ray technicians, we do have to embrace disciplines and knowledge outside of traditional military fields. We need to find ways to bring this into our world. The concepts behind balancing direct and indirect approaches and what amounts to or what some describe as a global counterinsurgency effort are not new to how we conduct irregular warfare in, in many ways. The Cold War was the aberration, and this is back to more traditional forms of warfare. I'll, I'll quote, pure military skill is not enough. A full spectrum of military, paramilitary, and civil action must be blended to produce success. The enemy uses economic and political warfare, propaganda, and naked military aggression in an endless combination to oppose a free choice of government and suppress the rights of the individual by terror, by subversion, and by force of arms. To win this struggle, our officers and men must understand and combine the political, economic, and civil actions with skilled military efforts in the execution of this mission. I'm quoting President John F. Kennedy in his foreword to a 1962 United States Army manual on special warfare. Special warfare being the community that ultimately evolved into the joint special operations community that I now serve. Pure military skill will not be enough. While the ability to conduct high-end direct action activities will always remain urgent and necessary, and the highest end, most technology-enabled man-hunting and thing-hunting operations are conducted by special operations forces, we acknowledge that it is the indirect actions that will have the most decisive and enduring effects. The balance and intertwining of direct and indirect are key. And so now I'll quote Sun Tzu. There are not more than five primary colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black. Yet in combination, they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, and bitter. Yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle, there are not, there are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect. Yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and indirect lead on to each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle. You never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? And that is the business and the beauty of special operations forces. I am ready for your questions. I'll say up front that I won't provide any meaningful detail on specific operations that are being conducted under a geographic combatant commander's authority, but I'm happy to talk about just about anything else you would like to address. Thank you very much.